on World News Tonight. Military execution. Myanmar goes from democracy to dictatorship as ASEAN troubled over the unacceptable executions. Rampaging wildfire. Another fire breaks out in California as it becomes the biggest inferno this year with brutal heat alerts. Historic apology. Pope Francis pleads for forgiveness from indigenous people in Northern America. And slime at slow move. All things slime at an institute for all who enjoys a little bit of messy gooiness. This is Other Than Anna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Suzanne Chanelli. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. And we're starting off tonight's broadcast in Myanmar. Over a year of unrest, the country is still facing brutal dictatorship as the military took over the nation. 1st of February 2021, the day Myanmar's transition to democracy came to a halt. Wide-scale election fraud was the reason generals used to justify taking back control, a claim denied by the Election Commission. Nobel Peace Prize winner Aung San Suu Kyi, the country's de facto leader at the time, was arrested. This after, her National League for Democracy party came out on top in the 2020 general election. President Win Mit was also detained. A state of emergency was declared and powers were handed to the commander-in-chief of the powerful Tatmadaw. The military coup, however, didn't go down well with the public. Protesters poured out onto the streets across Myanmar cities. On the 27th of March 2021, a month after the coup, the military changed tack and began suppressing the protests with force. 163 people were killed in the span of 24 hours. The message from the country's generals was clear. Demonstrators would either be thrown in jail or killed. Despite this, general strikes and demonstrations continued. According to one local NGO, close to 2,000 civilians have been killed and 15,000 arrested since last year's coup. The killing of imprisoned democracy activists is the latest move the junta has taken to suppress the political opposition in Myanmar. Now, Myanmar's junta has executed four prisoners, including a former lawmaker from Aung San Suu Kyi's party and a prominent activist in the country's first use of capital punishment in decades. The execution sparked widespread condemnation, heightened fears that more death sentences will follow, and prompted calls for the international community to take sterner measures against the already isolated junta. With the escalating violence, with these uh, horrific atrocities that the junta has carried out, uh, there can be no business as usual with this uh, regime. The execution of four democracy activists, Jimmy Jomen Yu, Piu Zeyada, Law Men Ong, and Ong Thia Zo, by Myanmar's military junta has received widespread international condemnation. The United States said Monday that all options were on the table as it considered its response. The four men were sentenced to death in closed-door trials in January and April. They were accused of carrying out terror acts against the army that seized power in a coup last year, which unleashed a bloody crackdown on its opponents. Self-exiled journalist Ong Nang So says the international community needs to take action. Many people are like, uh, uh, how to say, frustrated with frustrated on the action of the international community. It's just wars, you know. It's like, oh, we will do this, we worry, we did that, blah, 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 you know. It's nothing in action, you know. If there is anything in action, such kind of execution would not happen. Amnesty International's Kiara San Giorgio said the executions were an enormous setback and called for increased efforts to put accountability mechanisms in place. We have seen uh, again and again uh, through the developments and the appalling human rights record of the uh, military authorities in Myanmar uh, since uh, February 2021 uh, that uh, the more space um, they're left with, uh, the more they tend to escalate and, uh, uh, and the death penalty um, with the uh, more than 100 the sentence has been imposed uh, by military tribunals uh, in deeply unfair proceedings is a clear example of uh, uh, what they are capable of and, that the, and the, uh, of the fact that they're not going to stop there. Tom Andrews is the UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation in Myanmar. I am afraid that um, even more floodgates are now uh, opening 
and that there is even going to be a less, less restraint on the part of the junta to um, continue its, its attacks on the people of Myanmar and to try to instill um, fear even more fear in the population. Andrew says that with 140 people on death row, the executions, Myanmar's first in decades, indicates that the junta intends to carry out those sentences. A spokesperson for the junta last month defended the death penalty, saying it was justified and used in many countries. The already reduced gas supplies coming from Russia's Nord Stream 1 looks set to be squeezed tighter still. It said that from today onwards, a time supplies will halve from 40% to 20% capacity. Russia tightened its gas squeeze on Europe as Gazprom said supplies through the Nord Stream 1 pipeline to Germany would drop to just 20% of capacity. The Kremlin-controlled energy giant said flows would fall to 33 million cubic meters per day starting Wednesday, claiming the disruption was caused by maintenance issues. But Germany said it saw no technical reason for the latest reduction, which comes as Russia and the West exchange economic blows in response to what Moscow calls its special military operation in Ukraine. Nord Stream 1 is the single biggest Russian gas link to Europe. The European Union has repeatedly accused Russia of resorting to energy blackmail, but the Kremlin said Europeans were suffering the consequences of sanctions that they themselves imposed on Russia. Gazprom had already cut gas exports through the route to 40 percent capacity last month, citing delays in the return of a turbine Siemens Energy was servicing in Canada, which had initially banned the equipment return, citing sanctions. European politicians have challenged that explanation, with Germany saying the turbine in question was not meant to be used until September. President Vladimir Putin warned the West this month that continued sanctions risked triggering catastrophic energy price rises for consumers around the world. Putin foreshadowed the latest gas cut in comments on the Nord Stream 1 compressor last week, calling into question whether the return turbine would be operational. Now Canada says they will return the Nord Stream 1 Siemens gas turbines. At least one of them will be returned. But in what condition will they be returned? Politicians in Europe have said Russia could cut off gas flows this winter, which would thrust Germany into recession and lead to soaring prices for consumers already grappling with higher prices for food and energy. Russia is the world's second largest oil exporter after Saudi Arabia and the world's largest exporter of natural gas. Ukraine has said it hopes a United Nations broker deal aimed at easing global food shortages as Ukrainian grain shipments are set for export within days after a Russian strike on the port of Odessa cast doubt over Moscow's commitment. Ukrainian officials appeared optimistic on Monday, saying grain could start moving again from the country's Black Sea ports within a matter of days. We expect the first shipment to be completed this week. The UN echoed the Deputy Infrastructure Minister's sentiment. Russia, Ukraine, Turkey and the UN agreed to a deal last week allowing safe passage in and out of three Ukrainian ports aimed at easing global food shortages. But a Russian missile strike on the port of Odessa the next day raised questions about whether it would still go ahead. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov brushed off criticism on Monday, saying Moscow only targets military infrastructure. Speaking about the episode which you mentioned that happened in Odessa, there is nothing in the commitments that Russia signed up to in Istanbul on July 22nd that would prohibit us from continuing our special military operation, destroying Ukrainian military infrastructure and other military targets. Ukraine's grain exports have been stalled since February, when Russia sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine in what it calls a special military operation. Before that, Ukraine and Russia accounted for one-third of global wheat exports. Rising energy prices and a global wheat shortage are some of the most far-reaching effects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Moscow denies responsibility for the food crisis, blaming Western sanctions for slowing its food and fertilizer exports, and Ukraine for mining the approaches to its ports. Ukraine's infrastructure minister said officials are taking steps to make sure product moves safely.
All convoys will be accompanied by Ukrainian rescue vessels. They will go first along with the vessels of the Ministry of Infrastructure. But we must say that this is not a simple process. Pope Francis apologized for the evil inflicted on the indigenous people of Canada on the first day of the visit focused on addressing decades of abuse at Catholic-run residential schools. Making good on his promise, Pope Francis on Monday apologized to Canada's native people for historical abuses of indigenous children at the hands of the church. I ask forgiveness, in particular, for the ways in which many members of the church and of religious communities cooperated, not least through their indifference in projects of cultural destruction and forced assimilation promoted by the governments of that time, which culminated in a system of residential schools. The Pope's plea for forgiveness was greeted with applause by members of the indigenous community, as well as over 2,000 survivors of the infamous residential school system. More than 150,000 indigenous children were forced to attend Christian schools in an organized effort to isolate them from the influence of their homes and culture. They were then Christianized and assimilated into mainstream society, but many were starved, beaten and sexually abused in a system that Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission called cultural genocide. In a ceremony fraught with symbolism on Monday, a traditional headdress was placed on the leader of the Catholic Church as indigenous elders wiped away tears convinced by his apology. I really, really believed the first time I trusted, I trusted, fully I trusted someone. And I, with my whole heart and soul, I really believe he is my Pope. Pope Francis will end his brief papal visit with a trip to the homeland of Canada's largest Inuit population. There he'll once meet again former residential school students before returning to Italy. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Now, with the World Health Organization declaring a global health emergency over the ongoing monkeypox outbreak, experts and public health workers are crying out for more assistance. Harun Tulunai, a sexual health activist who is also HIV positive, recovered from an unusually severe bout of monkeypox in London. Outside Africa, where monkeypox is endemic, the viral disease has been rapidly spreading, mainly through sex between men. The World Health Organization declared it a global health emergency over the weekend. I remember clearly that I cried on the phone to her saying that I think I'm going to die because I can't eat, I can't drink, you know, it's, I can't even swallow my own spit. Though it can cause extremely painful lesions for some, the disease is generally mild and can pass without the need for intensive treatment. But access to existing treatment and vaccines has been difficult and awareness has been low. The WHO label, a public health emergency of international concern, could unlock funding to collaborate on sharing vaccines and treatments. And health experts say it's now crucial to play catch up. For the nonprofit group Test Positive Aware Network, or TPAN, the stepped up response couldn't come sooner. On Monday, it hosted a monkeypox vaccination drive in Chicago, Illinois. But dozens were turned away, according to CEO Kara Eastman, because the group didn't have enough resources. So far this year, there have been more than 16,000 cases of monkeypox in more than 75 countries. In the summer of extreme temperature in the U.S. is the worst wildfire of the year, choking the skies of Northern California and drought conditions are ensuring plentiful fuel for the fire. This is what California's wildfire season looks and sounds like now. Exploding into the largest inferno in the state this year, the Oak Fire burning near Yosemite is also the most volatile blaze of the season, torching everything in its path. Even with 2,000 firefighters on the ground, the Oak Fire is raging out of control 
destroying at least 10 structures, including newlywed Steve and Andrea Ward's home, which erupted into a fireball. She's looking over my, my shoulder and, you know, this home that we had just gotten married at two weeks ago, it, it explodes. With 3,000 people forced to evacuate, 3,200 structures still lie in the path of the fire. Stop there. But even a steady line of fire retardant isn't stopping the blaze. Visible from outer space, the suffocating blanket of smoke has now drifted hundreds of miles, choking the skies near the Bay Area. It comes amid deadly temperatures blanketing the country, 37 million under heat alerts. But it's the Pacific Northwest that could see temperatures rise as high as 115 degrees. Back on the fire line, some good news. The inferno is moving towards burn scars like these, where there's little fuel for flames. For some, the damage is already done. California's most destructive fire of the year certainly won't be the last. Amidst reports that U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi is planning a visit to Taiwan in the coming weeks, China has delivered a stern warning to Washington about the consequences of such a visit. China has warned the U.S. that it was getting seriously prepared for the possibility of a visit by Washington's House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to Taiwan next month. Suppose the U.S. side clings obstinately to its misconduct. China is bound to take resolute and powerful measures to safeguard its national sovereignty and territorial integrity. All consequences entailing from that should be completely borne by the United States. Coinciding with Beijing's strong rhetoric, Taiwan staged air raid drills on Monday while its military was mobilized for routine defense exercises. While there was no direct link between China's renewed threats and Taiwan's defensive moves, they do point to increased tensions in the region, considered a potential hotspot for conflict. Pelosi has not yet confirmed when or even if she will visit. If the visit does take place, it will be the first trip in 25 years by a speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives to Taipei. An earlier visit planned for April was canceled due to COVID-19. Amid these developments, President Joe Biden said Monday that he still expects to speak with Chinese President Xi Jinping this week. He told reporters that the expected call will take place by the end of this week. This comes as she sent a message last week wishing Biden a speedy recovery from COVID-19. Tesla disclosed a second Sabina related to Chief Executive Elon Musk's Go Private tweets in 2018. The electric automaker said in a regulatory filing. More trouble for Elon Musk after the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission hit the Tesla CEO with another subpoena over the billionaire's tweets. Tesla disclosed on Monday that it had received a new subpoena related to, quote, compliance with an SEC settlement that required Musk's tweets to be vetted by Tesla's lawyers if they contained material information. That agreement followed SEC scrutiny over Musk's 2018 tweet that he had funding secured to take Tesla private. Since then, the SEC subpoenaed the electric car maker over a tweet from Musk that asked his Twitter followers whether he should sell 10% of his Tesla stake to cover tax bills on stock options. Tesla said on Monday it will cooperate with government authorities on the latest subpoena. The SEC declined to comment. The regulator is also looking into Musk's tweets about his $44 billion deal to buy Twitter, asking him last month about a post in which he said the, quote, deal couldn't move forward unless Twitter provided more data about fake accounts. The trial over Twitter's lawsuit against Musk over abandoning the takeover is set to begin in October. As if Musk's dance card wasn't full enough, the Wall Street Journal reported late Sunday that Musk had engaged in a brief affair with Nicole Shanahan, the wife of Google co-founder Sergey Brin. Musk responded, where else, on Twitter, denying the report, which cited unidentified sources, saying, quote, Sergey and I are friends and we're at a party together last night. I've only seen Nicole twice in three years, both times with many other people around, nothing romantic.
Welcome back to World News Tonight and for more news let's take you around the world in a minute. China is one step closer in completing its orbital outpost after successfully docking a second laboratory module in its space station. Venice is introducing an entrance fee to day trippers looking to visit the iconic Italian city. Trials of the measure started this summer ahead of full implementation in 2023. Danish biotechnology company Bavarian Nordic said that the European Commission had given permission for its Invanex vaccine to be marked as protection against monkeypox as recommended by the European Medicines Agency. Indian devotees celebrated Shivaratri, a Hindu festival to offer prayers to Lord Shiva as a rite of colours enveloped the country with devouts pouring holy water and milk over Shiva Lingam a phallic representation of the god of destruction. The Japanese government is holding meetings in response to the country's first case of monkeypox virus detected in Tokyo. The infected person is a man in his 30s who returned from Europe and is currently in a hospital. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you missed to watch any of the stories we aired tonight, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. As we leave you tonight, let's take a look at New Yorkers having a blast with drenching themselves in slime. Stay safe and have a good night.